Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the latest webinar from the Royal College of Pathologists. Um, we're moving away from purely discussing the microbiology and virology and immunology uh, into more broader aspects of the pathology of COVID. Um, so uh, without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome Sebastian Brandner, who is a professor of neuropathology at University College London, Queen's Square Institute of Neurology. Um, and the topic tonight is the neuropathology of COVID, uh, which uh, certainly will be educational for me um, as I'm uh, a virologist. I'd be very interested to hear what, what the manifestations are in the central nervous system. Um, so I'll pass over to Sebastian. Thank you very much. Uh, well, so um, uh, without uh, further ado, I would like to start, first of all, thanking the uh, college for inviting me to give this presentation and um, I would like to talk today about the neurology of COVID-19, particularly the pathology and clinical implications. Okay, first of all, just to uh, show you a bit what I'm going to talk about, content and structure of my pres presentation. First of all, I'm going to talk about the receptors. What do we know about the uh, SARS uh, coronavirus entry into the brain? We talk about the distribution of the ACE2 receptor in the brain. And following from that, the hypothesized entry pathways into the central nervous system. And then I'm going to come to the clinical, neurological, and neuropathological manifestation of COVID-19, showing some brain imaging, autopsy finding, and the correlation to the neurologic presentation. So first, let's start with the, uh, uh, what is known about the ACE2 receptors. These were two back-to-back -back cell papers uh, earlier in March 2020, showing very robust evidence that the SARS coronavirus docks to the ACE2 receptor, and that why uh, finds its way into, uh, into the human uh, uh, cells. This uh, access can be blocked by administering uh, neutralizing antibodies or by pharmacological intervention with the receptor system. And the first hint that the coronavirus in the brain uh, might have to do something um, uh, together, you know, that there might be a, co a connection, was from reports uh, in March 2020 uh, of people who lost smell and taste. And that hinted to uh, coronavirus that, uh, that it could target the nervous system. And not only by just smell and taste, but actually much more severe neurological signs such as confusion, stroke, seizures, and a subset of patients with COVID-19. So that connection of the central nervous system and the receptor system that the virus uses to access the brain led to the speculations of uh, how, uh, first of all, the investigation, how the ACE2 receptor is distributed in the brain. Let me show this here. This is from the Allen Brain Atlas. You can see in this rotating model, these red squares here, they're all the receptors, the ACE2 receptors, which are in the pons and in the thalamus. And to show that a bit more clearly, this is just the cerebellum and this is the thalamus. Let's rotate that a little bit. You see here that is ventral, which is the brainstem, essentially the pons, and here in the thalamus. So this was a very attractive um, distribution to speculate that the virus might enter uh, through these structures into the brain. And um, a lot of reviews and articles were written about that. And this is a very um, useful and very comprehensive re uh, review in JAMA Neurology on the neuropathogenesis and neurological manifestation of the coronaviruses. And one section deals with the ACE2 uh, expression. They say it's the neurons, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes. So essentially, in all the cells that constitute the brain. They say also specific brain regions, substrate nigra, uh, somewhere in the forebrain, and of course, also in the olfactory bulb. Now, when we look a little bit closer to the reference that they cited, we have to be perhaps a little bit cautious because this study is actually just a readout from gene expression metadata from databases, public databases. There's not yet experimental data. I don't think there have been recent experimental data that really study the distribution and in particular how the ACE receptor can actually give entry to the virus. Looking at the next slide is going to show us the potential mechanisms of neuroinvasion. And uh, one very obvious one is the retrograde spread uh, through transsynaptic um, movement across infected neurons. 
then the olfactory nerve as an entry into the brain, then the infection of vascular endothelium of brain vasculature. So here the red particles of the virus infect the uh, endothelium and uh, cross the blood-brain barrier, which is here constituted by the uh, astrocytic end feed, and they infect the, the astrocytes. The alternative way of getting the brain is obviously through leukocyte or lymphocyte migration. Infected cells migrate, cross the blood-brain barrier, and go in the brain. So these are the thought that the presumed mechanisms of the viral invasion into the brain. But let's now also look at the um, way the brain reacts to a systemic COVID infection. So systemic disease in patients with COVID uh, or, uh, or coronavirus infection, COVID disease, they frequently have a coagulopathy leading to microinfarcts, which can be modulated by ECMO, so extracorporeal membrane ex oxygenation, which is often necessary because these patients are admitted often in a hypoxic state. Then many patients have multi-organ failure, which causes then hypoxia and the infarcts. There is a systemic inflammation, uh, the buzzword cytokine storm, leading to encephalitis, cytokine-mediated, and inflammatory encephalopathy. So these are all uh, effects on the brain through systemic um, uh, effects of the viral infection. Then there are the presumed direct viral uh, e effects uh, through viral invasion into the brain, viral meningitis, encephalitis, and endothelitis. But then apart from the CNS, also the peripheral nervous system and muscle can be involved. So anosma here is the olfactory system and then neuropathies, myopathies as a, as a side effect. Finally, the post-infectious effects are uh, 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 manifesting as ADEM, so acute disseminated encephalomyelitis and the goyan barry syndrome in the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system. In the following few slides, I would like to illustrate now uh, the COVID-19 neurological complications. We have uh, had two post-mortem uh, examples, and I'm going to present them in, in fairly good detail. The first one is a patient in his early 50s, had as a pre-existing condition, type 2 diabetes, asthma, and he presented with a two-week history with cough, fever, and dyspnea to the a &E department. And a few days later, he was transferred to another hospital, he was then intubated, ventilated, transiently required uh, venovenous ECMO, so uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, had massively uh, increased inflammatory and um, uh, coagulation markers, went into cardiac arrest after four days, and then um, uh, uh, died after th uh, 13 days after admission. At day four, just after the cardiac arrest, a computer tomography was performed, which shows here and here, this slightly darker area is a very, very acute ischemic infarction here as well. And these have kind of um, consolidated a little bit after a couple of weeks, plus much more recent infarcts uh, in this area um, uh, uh, turning up. So let's now look at the postmortem findings. So this brain was massively swollen, edematous, 1,500 grams is way above the normal weight, uh, which is normally in the, in the 1,300s um, on the edematous. And uh, you can see here uh, evidence for um, oncos herniation, but more importantly, lots of hemorrhagic surfaces, more or less congruent with the areas of the um, uh, ischemic infarctions, the frontal, cerebellum, many, many places. So then we dissected the brain. First of all, I'm going to show you an area corresponding to this transection. And here, this very obvious lesion here in the basal ganglia. You can see here the internal capsule uh, and the caudate and the putamen. That is an infarct. Then we have these watershed infarcts here. And then we have a smaller ischemic infarct out here. And I'm going to show you now the histology of this ischemic infarct in the, uh, in the, in the uh, basal ganglia. So first of all, this is the overview histology. You can see, you can make out the internal capsule here. That corresponds to the caudate, putamen, pallidum. Now this is the infarcted area. So this is a relatively large area, but you can see this very intriguing dark discoloration. And this dark discoloration is actually a migrating front of uh, leukocytes that essentially infiltrate and evade this area, necrotic area of this infarct. So a very significant leukocytoclastic inner rim. So we speculated 
because that is something that we don't usually expect in an infarct. I speculated this might be due to the uh, uh, possible uh, cytokine, uh, ex, uh, uh, cytokine uh, upregulation, essentially an exaggerated immune response. The true margin of the infarct is here, and that's a very conventional, um, it's a very conventional uh, granulation tissue here, uh, macrophages here, and the geometrist brain on the other side. And let's go a little bit further. Posterior in the same brain, uh, here you see multiple pathologies. Again, watershed infarcts here and here between the anterior, middle, and posterior circulation. Posterior infarct here in the uh, hippocampus and the thalamus. And this is the most interesting thing. Uh, here, hemorrhagic infarct on the first side, uh, like a, a usual hemorrhagic infarct, but we found apart from this relatively... Um, a straightforward uh, infarct with a wedge shape um, uh, configuration, also lots of hemorrhages. And the histology of the hemorrhage shows multiple small fibrin thrombi uh, thrombotic um, uh, depositions in the, in the blood vessels. So that's something obviously related to a more systemic uh, thromboembolic event. Summarizing the key features here now, so the CNS involvement in this patient was caused by multi-organ failure causing the hypoxia and infarcts, coagulopathy causing microthrombi. We would normally expect microinfarcts, but of course, this is all uh, superseded by these massive uh, infarcts that we saw there. ECMO certainly may have contributed to some of the coagulopathy or modulated it. And then, of course, inflammation, which we have seen with this very massive leukocyte reaction. So that was this patient. And the next patient I'm going to present to you uh, was a female in her mid-60s with asthma and hypertension, otherwise relatively well and no major diseases beforehand. She had a few days history of cough, dyspnea, was admitted, and after a couple of days intubated, she needed a lot of oxygen when she was admitted, and then she needed ventilation, had renal failure, needed renal replacement therapy, a lot of lung problems, lots of x-rays uh, uh, of the chest, needed sedation initially, and when they stopped the sedation, she still remained unresponsive. Also, this patient, ferritin upregulation and uh, C-reactive protein uh, significantly increased. She died of uh, approximately uh, four weeks after admission. She had an MRI done uh, after the third week, which I'm going to show you in direct correlation with the um, uh, pathology. So the brain looked quite unremarkable. In fact, it has a low brain weight. So it, in fact, this has some, some degree of atrophy, no edema, no herniation. And also the coronal sections, relatively unspectacular. So this is relatively uh, far frontal. These are the ventricles. And you can see here, small little dots. We saw them only, we really noticed them only after we correlated that to this MRI. So this was uh, all um, uh, together with our radiologist, Rolf Jäger, who pointed us to these, uh, to these uh, lesions. He said, oh, these are all small acute infarcts. Look out for those. So this is how they look. And indeed, histology, low power. Can you see here this infarct? This is exactly that infarct. But then also looking at um, um, macrophage marker, CD68, reveals that there's actually hundreds of these small infarcts. You can just about make them out here. And this is just a high magnification, a bit of iron deposition here, macrophages with uh, iron pigment, macrophages here, CD68, and evidence of axon damage, kind of uh, axon swellings here in this neurofilament stain, but we did not see demyelination in, the, in this patient. Other features, uh, small um, white matter microbleeds, again, prompted by a radiologist saying, oh, you need to look there. So we uh, uh, correlated that exactly and they're kind of acute or subacute uh, hemorrhages. Thirdly, this is something quite obvious and very interesting. So bilateral um, uh, globus pallidus infarct. So that points to global ischemia or global uh, hypoxia rather. You can see here, that's uh, the microscopic view in the histology. And here you see the, um, the, microscope, the, the high magnification with lots of macrophages. Established bilateral symmetrical globus pallidus infarct. Finally, this is really a highlight because our geologist also said, look, down here, there must be an encephalitic uh, process because that um, um, uh, and, um, is quite hyper intense. So I flipped the MRI uh, because this is right-hand side to correlate with the brain. 
You see that here and here, we didn't see anything. But when you look at the, um, uh, at the histology, you see, in fact, uh, lymphohistocytic leptomeningitis on the right side and nothing on the left. So um, that's quite nice radiological pathological correlation. Summarizing the events in this uh, patient, so we uh, this patient had a coagulopathy leading to microinfarcts, but she also had multi-organ failure. Remember, she had all these kidney uh, problems and the lung problems, which led to the uh, hypoxia leading to the bilateral basal ganglia damage. Then, of course, some inflammation, uh, which we saw, but we don't actually know whether it's a systemic inflammation or, in fact, what we saw, perhaps a consequence of a direct viral invasion, viral meningitis. So we debated about that. We don't have any evidence for either of that. We're looking into this by further workup of these cases. So now I would like to follow this up by uh, published findings from elsewhere. So, for example, here in this, uh, in this case report, um, acute necrotizing encephalopathy with brainstem involvement. So here, uh, basal ganglia, amygdala, brainstem, so very severe, often bilateral involvement. In this case report, um, a patient with uh, ARDS, she had um, meningitis encephalitis here unilateral um, in the hippocampus. And this is a very interesting and very comprehensive study, Mount Sinai uh, COVID-19 autopsy experience, currently still uh, uh, located on MedArchive. But they essentially show the postmortem results of um, more than uh, 30 patients. And the interesting finding is something very similar that we see in a number of patients. So these hemorrhagic uh, um, uh, changes, and very interestingly also here, multiple thrombotic events in this patient. This finally is a study uh, was published uh, about three weeks ago from a German group looking at six postmortem uh, COVID brains uh, in people between the 60s and 80s. And they describe an encephalitis which I think is probably very modest. You know, there is a little bit of um, uh, inflammation, but it's actually not very, uh, not very significant. They also describe uh, meningeal T cell infiltrate similar to what we have seen. So in summary, uh, these are the, the key findings, inflammatory responses in the brain. And I would like to uh, finalize my talk by summarizing the clinical, man clinical neurological manifestation so that's a large series of uh, patients who were admitted to our hospital, to the National Hospital of Neurology and Neurosurgery, to the COVID-19 MDT. And this MDT is run together with the uh, infectious disease consultants and virology colleagues at UCLH. And I got all this data from Michael Zandi and Hadi Manji, who kindly provided them for me for this talk. And they all lead the neurosurgery COVID-19 group. And... Um, one group of patients had uh, encephalopathies with delirium and psychosis, but no distinct MRI or CSF abnormal uh, abnormalities. Another group, inflammatory CNS syndromes, encephalitis, parainfectious or postinfectious, and then, as already described, ADEM, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, hemorrhage, necrosis, myelitis, similar to what we have seen, then ischemic strokes, often associated with a poor thrombotic, uh, thrombotic state of the patient, often a pulmonary thromboembolism, which is something our first patient had. Then peripheral neurological disorder, parainfectious, Guillain-Barre syndrome, plexopathy, and finally also a smaller number of people with cranial neuropathies and pseudotumor cerebral. With this slide, I would like to finish my talk <clears throat> and a big thanks to our colleagues at uh, Geisens and Thomas's, Ulla and Anna, histopathologist who did the autopsies of these uh, two uh, brains that I uh, described today. We did, we, we um, received them for histological analysis, but of course the GSTT critical care medicine uh, colleagues, Nick Barrett, um, Vivek and Manu. Rolf Jäger is a neuroradiologist from our hospital and also thanks to Lucy uh, from GSTT who made those images uh, available to us. My um, uh, consultant colleagues at, in my department, neuropathologists, Zana and Maria, with whom we had lots of discussion and debates on the pathogenesis and also the preparation of this material for publication and very, very helpful discussions with the COVID-19 MDT, particularly Hadi Manji, Michael Zandi and Michael Lan. And this is a historical view of these two hospitals. And I thank everyone for tuning in and uh, 
it's open for questions now. Thank you very much indeed for a, a fabulous overview. So you've made a very convincing case that patients with COVID may suffer very significant neuropathology. Um, but what you've shown mostly is the neuropathology arising because of thrombosis, infarction, and maybe hemorrhage. Can we try and nail what to me is a key question, which is what is the evidence that the virus is in the brain? So we don't have direct evidence for that. That's what I explained. And actually that uh, many kind of meningeal inflammation could well be explained by systemic inflammation. But you could probably argue that the majority of the patient with neurological manifestation complications actually survive. This slide was published, I think, at Lancet, um, pretty much at the beginning. What this shows is about, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, more than 20 patients who died of, um, with uh, multi-organ uh, failure. And that shows, um, so here down here, the blue uh, bar, the number of existing conditions, uh, uh, comorbidities. But here you see the SARS-CoV RNA copies per cell. Only two of these many patients had actually high copy numbers, and this is the brain. Only minimal copy numbers in, uh, in the brain. Uh, but you, have, you got the message. So that is, that is quite interesting. Um, and to understand how the virus could directly, uh, whether there is actually direct damage. That's why I pointed out also all the circumstantial evidence of the ACE2 receptor, how the virus can theoretically get access to the brain, but I think a lot of this is still speculation. Okay. Um, do, we do we know that we've got reagents that would identify virus? So uh, I've got a specific question. Are there antibodies available for immunohistochemistry? So we, I can tell you we bought uh, five antibodies that are on the market. Uh, we're going to try them. We're also going to try uh, RNA scope, which is a, a in situ hybridization derived technology to amplify and specifically detect, detect RNA. And I think a lot of other people are doing exactly the same. I think this is a very obvious thing to do. So we are looking into this. And um, uh, yes, I would say yes, there are methods. Okay, uh, I'm grateful. I don't know who sent this in, but uh, someone's reported there are case reports of a virus RNA in the CSF. Okay. Um, and there's one recently in emerging infectious diseases. Um, so it, it remains a possibility that there is direct viral invasion. Um, clearly, one or two of the audience have had COVID. Um, so one is asking why he or she uh, got paresthesia. Is there any evidence for peripheral nerve involvement? Yes. Yes, I think one or two of the slides that I showed, uh, I think when, uh, when uh, the people who looked, watched that wind back on the, on the replay later on, I think uh, the slide with the four columns where I showed the systemic invol uh, the involvement of the systemic but also direct invasion and then uh, the um, post-encephalitic uh, uh, complications. So... Guillain-Barré, paresthesia is obviously a very mild form of a peripheral neuropathy. Hopefully it is mild in this instance, uh, but these are side effects that have been described. Okay, and another a clear person who's recovered from COVID is why is he or she still suffering from brain fog? Now, brain fog is a controversial concept. Uh, I've come across it a lot in, in the field of hepatitis C. Is it a recognized post-COVID effect that patients complain of? I have heard that. I heard it also through personal communication from people who had that and from the, from the news that people suffer from uh, post-COVID uh, kind of slow recoveries, if that is what the brain fog means. And speculating on the pathogenesis? I mean, you have seen how many, um, you know, how pleiotropic the effects of the viral infection can be on the brain. I think, you know, just alone that second patient uh, with the multiple, uh, with these multiple um, uh, pathologies in the brain, uh, you know, there is certainly an explanation. And I would expect that whoever suffers from that would have uh, MRI follow-up or some other neurological follow-up. Okay. Um, so some very specific questions here. Uh, have you seen hemorrhagic strokes? or um, subdural hemorrhage? 
we have seen subdural hemorrhage, just relatively small. I haven't shown that because it would uh, probably um, exceed the time frame. But yes, we saw tiny hemorrhagic subarachnoid hemorrhages. They were also visible on, on MRI. And uh, arguably, you could say that um, the pathology in the first uh, brain that I demonstrated with the microthrombi, you could interpret that as, as hemorrhagic infarction. We rather say it's an infarction with hemorrhage because we don't actually know whether it's the classical pathomechanism behind that, you know, with the reperfusion, but in fact, that it might be a different pathogenesis. We discussed that internally. I discussed it with my colleagues and um, we haven't come to a firm conclusion as to what, um, uh, what is the exact pathogenesis of those. Okay. Um, have you seen many children with neurological complications? And in particular, is it a feature of the multisystem inflammatory syndrome that everyone's very excited about? So we didn't see them. Uh, so we don't see it. Our hospital is adult only. So TAYA and adult only. I would have to look at uh, the reports from our colleagues from Great Ormond Street Hospital. Uh, but I don't have, I actually didn't look into any of that information. Okay. Um, and in the patients who do get the neurological uh, complications that you've described, do they all have underlying disease with multiple comorbidities or, or can that arise in someone who's otherwise previously fit and well? I would say that can affect people who are fit and well, I mean, clearly. And, uh, but I would say the majority have some underlying comorbidities and obviously many of the patients are of kind of uh, 50s uh, upwards. Okay, so here's something I wasn't aware of, but uh, is there any evidence for COVID-induced neuropsychiatric disorders? That was on my last slide, and the answer is yes. Psychotic uh, hallucinations, psychosis, without MRI, MRI corresponding findings and without CSF findings. That was on the last slide. Perhaps I was a bit too fast with that. Right. Um, and what about the eye? Uh, any retinal pathology? Um, I didn't look into this. I didn't look into this. It's possible, but I would have to Google or PubMed um, like everyone else. Uh, I mean, that rings particular bells to a virologist because the eye may be an immune privileged site and um, uh -huh. other viruses may hide out there. Uh, so it, it might be a concern that if, if the virus was in, in the eye, um, I've, I've not seen any reports. Um, I think we're uh, we're getting through most of the. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, it's a fair question. It, it, do you think that that all the patients who are seriously ill, which is we've seen many many patients in our in, intensive care on ventilators, essentially are they all going to have some degree of neurological damage? First of all, I can't answer that because I haven't actually, you know, obviously I haven't followed any of that up. I, well, I would rather not comment because it is possible, but I wouldn't think that the majority has. But I, I, I'd rather not comment. I think we need to read proper studies that look at large series of a couple of hundred patients and look at the long, also not only the acute follow-up, but the long-term follow-up. Okay. And what about when you're handling the brain tissue? So someone has asked uh, or, or says that the current RCPATH guidelines are rather vague on this topic. Do you handle the brain outside CL3? So first of all, we did not take out the brains. The brains were kindly retrieved for us by Ulla and Anna from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, Geisens and Thomases. So I would think uh, a usual high-risk post-mortem room with adequate PPE is, is, is adequate. And once it's been in formalin, I think it's fairly straightforward. So the, one of the single lines in the college document says formalin, formalin fixation inactivates the virus, which obviously is quite evident and we all know that. Uh, it doesn't say how long it needs. Uh, in the uh, American guideline, it says 72 hours to be on the safe side. And um, uh, we have received the brains in a three-week formalin fixed state. We were on the cautious side after slicing. We incubated them for another couple of days 
in formalin fixative, in standard formalin fixative, and then we photograph them and uh, cut them up, uh, also to ensure optimal fixation and also for the documentation. Okay. Uh, a reverse question from the one I just asked about do all seriously ill people have neurological complications is do you see patients who have neurological complications who have no other evidence of systemic disease? Um, uh, again, I don't what? know that. I don't know it, but I would, as, uh, I would guess, yes, probably people presenting predominantly with neurological uh, symptoms like the, you know, the uh, neuropathies, uh, myopathies, etc. Okay. I mean, you, you wouldn't know they had COVID unless someone thought to test them. Yeah. So yeah. They don't have systemic disease. Uh, interesting question about pathogenesis, which you may have studied. I don't know. Uh, any evidence for anti-neuronal antibodies? Not to my knowledge. And um, again, that's something that one uh, can investigate, again, on the clinical side. Uh, all those centers who had large numbers of admissions of people with neurological com um, complications uh, may at some point prospectively or the retrospectively test for uh, anti-neuronal antibodies. Okay. So I've just had a couple of new questions. How can at-risk patients for neurological injury be identified early and are there neuroprotective treatments? Again, I think uh, that's best asked to a neurologist. People like our colleagues, Hadi Manji, Michael Zandi, all the people involved in the neurological care, they see these patients every day. We see them a bit too late. Yeah, I mean, I suppose... I, I, I'm not aware of any uh, association from the patient demographics or, or features that link with... Um, I'm sure in the future, one can probably establish those. You know, now we have uh, retrospective large cohorts, people on long-term follow-up, follow up. one can do GWAS studies, one can do um, expression studies. Um, I think that's all going to come in the next couple of years. Okay. Um, these hemorrhages and infarcts that you're seeing, uh, are you seeing previously recognized stroke slash encephalopathy syndromes at a higher frequency, or do you think this is a new manifestation of disease? We think it's relatively new. I mean, of course, the individual pathology as such, you know, a stroke is a stroke. That's always a stereotype. But the patterns... And the manifestation, we think it is relatively consistent. So the pathology of our two brains was fairly consistent with other reports that have been published. So the micro hemorrhages, the micro infarcts, but also the global hypoxia, that's been reported, not only pathologically, but also imaging wise. So I think, yes, that's a pattern that emerges. And that's actually also the title of, of our submitted um, uh, study emerging patterns. Okay, w was there any neurology associated with the original SARS coronavirus, or indeed with the Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome coronavirus? I think so, but I don't remember the detail. I I read it a few weeks ago in the very beginning, but I don't recall the detail. Um, I think there were studies on the distribution of the ACE2 receptor. There were studies on um, the uh, previous coronavirus uh, or SARS um, entries, but I don't remember the details. Okay. Uh, back to the, the clinic. Um, myalgia, is that a major feature? I'm told the CDC website says around 35% of patients have myalgia. Sh should that be considered... Uh, an indicative syndrome, a symptom that should initiate COVID testing? Um, well, uh, from my non-clinical um, uh, experience, I would say it wouldn't harm <laughs> to do a COVID test, yeah. particularly if they're reliable. We heard so many uh, sessions on the testing um, strategies, the testing difficulties, the specificity, but one would uh, intuitively argue, yes, it, it wouldn't harm. Um, and in, with the news that we've had in the last week or so that dexamethasone actually makes a difference, uh, do you think that will impact on, well, uh, the question is, how does it work? I'm not sure that's a fair question for you. 
I think, yeah, I've been asked, the t first time I've been asked a question when I was uh, my early 30s, uh, someone asked me, so how do you use dexamethasin to reduce brain tumor edema? No one had an answer for that, closing some uh, blood-brain barrier pores. I think we are not wiser now, but I think we just use it and it is effective and seems to be effective. But again, the mechanism isn't known now and hasn't been no known for a long time. I mean, it's pretty much empirical. Yeah, okay. And I guess we don't know that the survival effect that dexamethasone has is particularly related to any actions it might have on the brain. I mean, presumably it's the well, multi-system effect. Well, it might have an effect on the brain and it might be protective in some form or shape. Okay. Um, so I'm, we're getting to the end of the time and I, I think I've covered all the questions that I've received and uh, that's mostly quite clinical. <laughs> Um, what, what uh, just out of interest, uh, yeah. do you know of studies that are going to be doing or have done, uh, if you like, research MRI scans of the brain or CT scans of the brain um, serially in patients to understand what's going on, even in patients who ultimately survive and, and leave the hospital? I think, first of all, the good news is the vast majority of the survive and leave the hospital on long-term follow-up. And I'm sure these are all serially, uh, serially uh, investigated. And our, uh, our uh, COVID-19 neurology MDT, they have very active radiology investigations. We have weekly MDTs where the uh, M uh, MRIs and, and other investigations are discussed in an, uh, in an online MDT so I'm sure this is a very active area of, of clinical research here and elsewhere. So we can look forward to uh, some of these questions uh, being answered sometime in the future. Yeah, definitely. Okay, well, on that hopeful note, <laughs> I'd like to thank you very much indeed, again, for the very clear talk that you yeah. gave and for standing up to a set of questions, not all of which <laughs> you might have been expecting. Um, but thank you very much for that.